had a great week here at Valley at Bible Church in VBS. Um, I attended the deacons meeting on t- Thursday, and one of our deacons, Steve Keck, said, who was teaching this week, he said, if anybody doubts the need for our new building out here, they need to be here during VBS because we were totally maxed out. Totally. We could not have uh, squeezed more kids into the classrooms, maybe a few more into the auditorium. But um, the need is great there, and so we keep praying that God will provide and we will move forward with that. So, good to see you this morning. Nice, cool breeze this morning. Beautiful Sunday, day to worship God. And we're going to begin this portion by praying. Would you join with me, please? Father, we do thank you for your grace that is abundant in so many ways. Thank you that you are a gracious God, demonstrating that from the beginning of the Bible to the end. Open our eyes to see that truth today. And we thank you, Lord, that by that grace we come to you and approach you, not clothed in our own deeds or righteousness, but in that of Christ alone. Thank you that you have justified us by faith. You have declared us to be righteous based upon our faith in Christ crucified and risen. And I pray, Lord, that if there is anyone here this morning that has not experienced that justification, that this would be the day of their salvation. We pray, Father, for the children once again who trusted Christ as Savior this week. We pray that that fruit would grow in their lives, that they would be mighty in their generation. Pray for their parents, that they too would walk with you find you, and serve you. We pray for more opportunities to minister to these these young ones and their families, all for your sake and for your glory. As we turn our attention to your word, we ask that the Spirit of God would take the word of God and make us like the Son of God. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in our study, The Road to Redemption, and we come to the portion where we are going to be talking about the patriarchs, particularly Abraham. Now, where we have been so far is we have seen uh, the four events of the book of Genesis, creation, fall, flood, and the nations. And we'll put this up on the screen, please. Yeah, there we go. So this is where we have been so far. And last week we, we, we talked about the nations, where all the nations came from and all the languages. And that is kind of a hinge story going into the, the story of the patriarchs. And we begin with Abraham. In fact, many people say that the Bible begins here with Abraham. That everything before this was prologue. And in many ways it is. And we, we saw where did everything come from? It came from Uh, the creation of God. Well, why is everything so messed up? Because of the fall of man. And then we see the flood, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, and then the nations. And this is all the story, the the primeval story of the, the, the beginning of mankind. And now we're going to see the beginning of the Hebrew race. And this is key because Abraham is probably next to Jesus, the key figure, I think, in the in all of the scripture. I remember of my ordination exam, one of the guys said, uh, Uh, Give me a quick outline of the Bible. And I just kind of scrambled in my brain. I said, well, okay. Um, God chose a man, Abraham, through whom would come a nation, Israel, through which would come the Savior, Messiah. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much the outline of the Bible. So from here on out, we're seeing the story of redemption. And we're on the road to redemption, which is the book of redemption in Exodus. Now, let me ask you a question. How does the the Bible portray people? How do you think it does? um, I I use various Bible reading guides throughout the year, and so every year in uh, January, I'm always in Genesis. In the last few years, the thing that has really um, hit me is that uh, the Bible describes people with all of their faults and all of their flaws, and, and it just describes them as sinners. Sometimes you hear people talk about, well, the Bible is such a horrible book because it's full of violence, there's war, and there's murder, and there's rape, and there's lying and stealing. And I go, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, that's the way this world is. That's the way people are. 
And the Bible does a good job of portraying people just the way they are. It doesn't sugarcoat it, and sometimes we think it does. It doesn't stylize the life of David, for instance, or Peter or Paul or Abraham, for that matter. It does not put them on a pedestal. In fact, the only one that is on a pedestal is Christ, right? He is the only one to be worshipped, and he is the only one that is perfect. And so we are, we are seeing that the Bible does not hide sin from us in the, in the Scriptures. It describes it. It describes people as they are, and the reason is so that we can see ourselves as we are, so that we can see God as he is, and so that we can see grace. Now, we have a tendency to put these people on a pedestal and think of Abraham. Well, he was the perfect guy. Well, yes, he was in the, the hall of fame of faith in, in Hebrews 11, and many of these people are, but God is the only one who ends up on that pedestal. Three things I want you to learn this morning. If you walk out of here with these three things, you can write them down now. If you'd like, we're going to come back to them throughout. But they are these, and that is, like us, the great men and women of the Bible are flawed. Just like us. They're no different than us. We're no different from them. And except for Jesus, he is the only perfect one. In fact, all the stories of the Bible beginning here are now leading up to the story of the perfect man, Jesus. This is the beginning of that story with the life of Abraham. Second of all, in the face of the fact that we are all flawed, and they are too, God is gracious. And God demonstrates himself to be a gracious God from the beginning to the end of Scripture. And third, God calls us to live in extremis. Why does he do that? Why does he put us in extreme situations to grow our faith? God puts demands on our lives. Faith is not easy. We should never think that it is. Growing in faith grows us in godliness and ultimately results in God's glory. So these are the things, the three things that we're going to see. We're not going to take them in this order, but let's, uh, let's revisit them in a different order, shall we? First of all, God calls us to live in extremis. To grow our faith. The word in extremis, it's actually one word, and it means to be put in an extremely difficult situation. If you've lived the life of faith for very long, you know that that is true. Faith grows in extreme and difficult situations. And Abraham is one who is called to an extremely difficult situation. Situations, actually many things, are those that are in extremis in his life that cause his fledgling faith to grow and for him to grow in godliness. Now the story, as we know, of Abraham begins in chapter 12, and a little bit before, we'll come back to this in a minute. But in chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country. By the way, we know at the beginning of the story his name is Abram, which means uh, exalted father, and his name will be changed to Abraham father of a multitude later on. I, if I refer to him as Abraham throughout, uh, forgive me. But anyway, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is the beginning of what we call the Abrahamic covenant. It will be reiterated and ratified in chapter 15. In chapter 7, it is further re 17 rather, it is further reiterated. He's going to say it again. But he is... He is making this covenant with Abraham, and, and he repeats it over and over again, the things that he's going to do for him. Now, Abraham actually left from Ur. We talked about Ur last week. And then he went to Haran, and then he went to Canaan. In fact, in Acts 7, 2, it says this. He said, Stephen, hear me, brethren and fathers, the glory of God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, that was in Ur, which is present-day Iraq, down in southern Iraq before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Leave your country and your relatives, and come into the land that I will show you. 
If you have your Bibles and you're open to chapter 12, you look back in chapter 11. Let me just go over this very quickly. In verse 24, we have uh, uh, Moses picks up the genealogy of Abram. And it says, Nahor lived 29 years and became the father of Terah. And Nahor lived 119 years after he became the father of Terah. And he had other sons and daughters. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So Abram had two brothers, Nahor and Haran. His father's name was Terah. Now these are the records of the generations of Terah, the father of Abram. Terah became the father of Abram, uh, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. That was Abram's nephew. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, and the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren and had no child. Now that is an important piece of the story. Sarai, Sarah, was barren. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughters-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, then Terah died in Haran. Now, so they, they begin in Ur of the Chaldees. Chapter 12, verse 1, seems to say that they were beginning from, uh, from Haran, but it says... The Lord had said to Abram, it can be translated that way, but the point is this. They started actually in Ur of the Chaldeans. Um, They left idolatry. His father was an idolater. In fact, Abraham probably was too. Joshua said this, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. They served other gods. I I showed you some pictures last week of the temple of the moon god, Seen. I took these pictures in Iraq in 2003, and this is is in Ur. This is in southern Iraq, and this is the temple of the moon god, Seen. This temple was there when Abraham and his father were there. In fact, they have, may, may have worshipped on this temple. This is a picture, the next slide is a picture from the, the top of the temple looking out on the excavation of the city of Ur, out on the plains. And this plain is actually the plains of Shinar that goes all the way up to Babylon where the Tower of Babel was built. So you can see part of, the, uh, uh, part of this is, uh, is a, a royal graveyard down there and they, in the 1920s they excavated many incredible things um, uh, treasures, and uh, they found evidence of human sacrifice and worship of the moon god seen. So Abraham may have been on top of this very ziggurat that I stood on where I took this picture. This was in existence at the time of Abram. But they worshipped false god. Abram was not a worshiper of Yahweh. The faith was not handed down to him. He was a worshiper of idols. The next picture is a picture of uh, some of the excavation of the city of Ur. And you can see that it's been dug out over the years and some of the walls that exist and there are many burial chambers and a lot of interesting things that are there. So the the, the point is, Abram and his family, he wasn't raised in Sunday school, okay? He wasn't raised as a Christian. He wasn't raised as a good little Jewish boy. He was raised as an idolater. So he is called out of this idolatry to serve the God of creation. Now, Abram, Abraham simply does what God asks him to do. He just, verse 4 says this, So Abram, Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions, which they had accumulated, and the persons which he had acquired in Haran, the persons that that he had acquired, some scholars think that he's talking about maybe acquiring slavery. Others think that he was called, he was a believer, and we'll see this later on, but he was proselytizing. He was bringing people to faith in the God of creation, people that he had collected. 
He had acquired them in Haran, and and they set out for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the yoke of Morah. Now the Canaanite was then in the land. This is kind of an ominous note because the oaks at Morah were a shrine to Canaanite deities. And this is a place where, and he says, the Canaanite were in the, the, in the land. The Canaanites will, will be the antagonists the rest of the story of Genesis. The Lord, the Lord appeared to Abraham there again. And he said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to Yahweh, the Lord, who appeared to him. Here in this place where there is a a shrine to false deities, Abraham is a worshiper of the true God. He builds an altar, of course, which assumes that there is sacrifice. And he makes a sacrifice, and he calls upon the name of the Lord. Verse 8, then he he proceeded rather from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent. Bethel is another place where Canaanite deities were worshipped, another uh, key uh, holy site for them, uh, with, it, with Bethel on the west on, and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord again, and he called upon the name of the Lord. Wherever he came to these shrines of false deities, he planted his stake, and he said, this is the land of the true living God who created heaven and earth, Yahweh. Abraham journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev. He was 75 years old. His wife was in his, her 60s. And I know people lived longer then, but they were still pretty old at that point. Sarai was barren, we know that. Uh, she didn't have the ability to conceive. God had made these promises. You can imagine how she felt. I mean, we have babies popping out all over around here, right? She could not conceive. You can imagine how she felt. But our map shows us this. They started from Ur of the Chaldees, uh, down in southern present-day Iraq, all the way up to Haran. Why did they go north? Well, they got the Sinai Desert in between. They wouldn't go directly across the desert. Haran, at the top of the map, is in present-day Turkey. And then he traveled down, actually, through Aleppo in Syria. Damascus came to Shechem, Bethel, And then he traveled toward the Negev, further regions where Canaanite deities were worshipped. Abraham just obeyed. God spoke to him. He didn't need anything else. I mean, I don't know what that was like. Um, He spoke to him. It also says he appeared to him. And so it was sufficient for Abraham. Divine revelation is always sufficient, is it not? It's always enough to... To obey, what you hold in your hands is just as divinely inspired as what Abraham heard from the mouth of God. God made it clear to Abraham that he was God and that he was speaking to him. Faith and obedience always respond to divine revelation. God reassured him of his promises and, and, God, and Abraham becomes a worshiper. True believers will always publicly proclaim the God that we serve. We will always gather and proclaim his name. Notice he had said to to Abram, I will make your name great. And so what does Abraham do? He makes great the name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh. He makes much of the name of the Lord and he proclaims the name of the Lord. Here are some lessons for us in the first part of the story. We're going to take great swaths, of course, in Genesis, and we're going to come back for part two of Abraham next week. But first lesson is this. The evidence of faith is obedience. Always has been, always will be. No obedience, no faith, right? No obedience, no faith. That much is clear throughout the Scriptures. And Abraham's faith was not in a plan. It wasn't a program. Okay, I'm going to send you here. Well, I believe in this plan. I believe in the vision. No, what he believed in was the person of God. Faith is not in a plan. It's not in people. It's not in a church. Our faith is always in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is the creator of the world. And the evidence of our faith will always be that we will obey what God says. Abram did that. God said, go, go. And, and he knew, God spoke to me, I am going. And he 
he believed and he went and he obeyed what God called him to do. Second of all, there will always be obstacles to your faith. Always. But those obstacles to faith and obedience are controlled by God and sometimes God actually places them there for our good. Faith is always tested throughout the scriptures. Faith is never easy. God doesn't ask us, ask us to do things that are just simple and easy and of no consequence. Think about the tests of Abraham. Leave everything. Go to a place that I'm going to tell you about. He didn't even give him the name of it to begin with. Where are we going? I'll tell you later. How many of us would do that? He gets to, to Canaan, and who's in the land? And the Canaanite were in the land, his enemies. Pagan religion was everywhere. These were the obstacles to his faith. There was a famine uh, right off the bat. He, gets, he finally gets there, and I don't know, maybe you've done this in your life. You made this big decision to get someplace, and you get there, and all of a sudden, everything falls apart. And that's what happened to him. He gets into the land. God told me to come here. There's a famine. What do you mean? I thought this was going to be a land of blessing and promise. There's famine. I think one of the, the um, um, part of the, the, the tests and obstacles of, of uh, Abraham was also wealth. He became a very, very wealthy man. Even in the midst of that faith, he, be, he remained humble and he did not flaunt his wealth, and he did not use it for ill purposes. He had childlessness. I mean, he's promised to be a great nation, but he was childless. He was 75 years old when he left there. His wife was in her 60s. There was a delay in the fulfillment of the promise. Yeah, okay, God says, oh, you're old, but you're going to have a kid. Well, when? And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And a delay in the promise. I mean, sometimes we have to wait for... God to answer our prayers, but we are much more impatient than Abraham was. And then there is, of course, the ultimate sacrifice that we'll look at le- next week, where he's called on to sacrifice his only son, his son whom he loves. All sorts of obstacles to his faith. So what are the obstacles to your faith? Think about that. How old are you? Are you still growing? Are you still learning? Are you still serving? Or have you retired from the faith? Abraham was an old man already. He didn't retire from the faith. I know as people grow older, there's a temptation to get spiritually lazy, to coast. I'm going to coast on into heaven. Abraham continued his zenith toward the time that he flamed out in his life. It's easy to become spiritually lazy. Now, God doesn't want us to be that as we get older. Uh, What you do now may look different from what you did when you were younger. But let me just speak to our elder saints for a moment. About 10 years ago, you, you know the watershed sermon that I gave at Valley Bible Church. I stood up here and I said, we're going to die unless we reach the next generation. And I said to you, many of you older people, I said, you have gray hair and you have much to offer. This is a time in your life when you, you can share. You've got more time. You have lessons. You have experience walking with God, raising kids. This is the opportunity. This is the time in your life to share that wisdom. Many of you weren't here then, and so we have gotten over the hump, and you need to hear that now. And you've seen many of our elder saints who have been very faithful to to serve at Valley Bible Church. But again, many of you weren't here, and you need to hear this. You you are at a time in your life, if you're going into your 50s and 60s and beyond, Abraham was 75 years old, you are a treasure. You have wisdom, you have something to offer the younger generation that they cannot get except from people who are wise and have lived long and lived well. And I know many of you have come, to, come here and you've been burned out, discouraged at other churches and thinking, you know, I'm just going to find a church where the word is taught. I can worship and I can go home. 
I understand that. I get that. Being Abraham, though, this might this is the you, age is an obstacle to faith. Don't let it stand in your way. How about you, younger folks? Younger people have seen the sacrifices of our older saints here at Valley Bible Church, and you see them, uh, you know, ushering and, and working in the nursery and working in hospitality. This is your church too, younger, younger folks. And what are you waiting for? You're waiting till you're older, till your kids are, are older, till your job is settled, till you're, you have more money. I know, you, I know how we think. I used to think the same way. And when we, when we build up those self-directed obstacles, we don't move forward and we don't grow. It's time, if you are a younger saint at Valley Bible Church and you don't have a ministry, it's time for you to, to take that baton from some of those older people who have been serving faithfully and, and come up to them and say, thank you, I got this. I got this. I encourage you to do so. For both, you just may be asking at this time, well, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't know what it is. As soon as I find out, then I'll find out. Well, I'll I'll do what God wants me to do. Start by doing what you know God's will is. What is God's will for you right now? It is to be a worshiper. It is to read your scriptures. It is to fellowship. It is to pray. It is to give. It is to serve. If you are doing those things, maybe the only thing you're lacking is to obey. And then God will show you. But obey we must. Yes. Amen. Second of all, the purpose of testing is godliness, and there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. Yesterday, Chris and I were praying with Hal and Chelsea before his surgery to remove tumor from his stomach, which went well, by the way. We were talking to his parents. And Chris said, yes, a time of growing in character. And Hal's mom said, there are no shortcuts. That's it. You don't get godly quickly. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time. It happens, you have to become deep and wide, and, and, and you have to, to struggle, and you have to fail at times. But the purpose we always keep in mind, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. You must know that. Otherwise, you get lost in the trial. Why is God doing this to me? Because it's for his glory and ultimately that you might become more godly. And the testing and and the purpose of that testing is that we would grow to become more like his son. Next lesson is this. There can be a fine line between faith and foolishness. Can you imagine how what people thought about Abraham? What? You're going where? He was already fairly wealthy in his family. Why would you do that? Why would you go there? Faith is never easy, and sometimes we need to dream big things. And and I know that uh, we don't have God speak to us. But I do believe that sometimes God does lead us. And, and, and too often times we think of when someone says, you know, God wants me to do such and such. And I've heard a lot of harebrained ideas in my life. And my media thought sometimes when I hear these things is, yeah, you got a little bit of spiritual indigestion. A little charismatic, are we? Sometimes God is doing that, though. God does lead us when we pray and when we ask and when opportunities come and when we have this this blinding insight and this idea of what God wants us to do. When when Tara and I went to the First Valley Bible Church in Arco, um, we were right on that line between faith and foolishness. (laughs) 18 people in the church when we began, they paid us $600 a month which then was not a lot of money. It's not a lot of money now. But if they were to pay me $6,000 a month, then I couldn't have done it. I would have become self-sufficient. I would not have learned to trust God. 
There is sometimes a fine line between faith and foolishness in terms of the way other people perceive it, perhaps. But I think we should be on the line because God always asks uh, great people of the faith to do great things for the faith. There are never small things, are they? I mean, we have to do small things in order to do greater things. But we should be near the line as individuals, as a church, to dream big and to ask big and to do big things. We mustn't take the safe way. Is the safe and the easy way really the way of faith? I know we oftentimes go to extremes. We don't believe that for God enough, and then we oftentimes dismiss grand ideas, again, as being a little charismatic. But let me ask you, what does God want you to do? Is there something big, something you've dreamed about, something you've always wanted to do, but you've just tamped down thinking, that's not realistic? He is able to do far abundantly beyond all that you could ever ask or think, so maybe he wants you to do this thing. Faith does not grow in comfort. And when we see Abraham throughout the Bible, he was always placed in extremis. When was the last time you asked God, what do you want me to do, God? So Abraham had a great faith But it would be a mistake to think that Abraham demonstrated a consistent faith throughout his life. In fact, the opposite is true, which brings us to point two. Like us, great men and women of the Bible were incredibly flawed. They weren't perfect. This is important because this is a big part of the story, the big story of the Bible because it goes back to God created the world and everything was good. What happened? Got messed up by the people that God created and and the rest of the story is God is fixing this but throughout the story people are still flawed. We see the continued results in the Bible characters. We also see the, the beginning of the answer to this is redemption. Ultimately, from Abraham to Jesus, that's going to be the, the answer to this imperfection of sin. So I want to burst your Abrahamic bubble for just a moment here. Abraham's faith and obedience were often imperfect and incomplete. Twice he lied about his wife. Twice. He gets down to Egypt and he says, hey, tell him you're my sister. Technically it was true. He wanted to save his life. It said that. He wanted to save his life. He was thinking about himself. Here's Abraham from the hall of faith. He, he threw his wife, one flesh, threw her under the bus two times. What do we learn from this? We learn that we have proclivities as well as he did. We are slow learners, and we oftentimes repeat our sins. Do you think that when Abraham went to Egypt and he had this opportunity to lie, do you think that that was the first time he ever lied in his life? This might have been his problem, his sin, that he, you know, maybe when he got in a group of people, he would embellish things and tell stories and make things up. I don't know. Maybe he told small lies when it, was con- in, when it was convenient. But he told this major lie twice in his life, and we see that in our lives too. At least you need to understand that, that we tend to, to repeat our sins and our, the bent that we have, the things that we struggle with. And he was in extremis. He was being tested. And as we saw a couple of weeks ago, every trial contains a temptation. Will you trust God? Will you believe his promises? Do you believe that he is good or will you take matters into your own hands? And that's what he did. And our sin always hurts others as it hurt his wife, dishonored God, He took his father and his nephew with him when he left for Canaan. I don't know if you've caught that, I've ever caught that or not. But he was told to leave your relatives, leave the house of your fathers. And uh, he goes with his dad. And he goes with his lot. Lot is going to be a thorn in his side. It's going to bear the consequences of not fully, not completely, not 100% um, obeying God. 
And then he tried to force God's hand and God's will with the sin with, with uh, Hagar, having sex with her and having a child to, to get an heir. We'll talk more about this next week. But he was not a perfect man. Yes, he made the hall of faith, but he was growing. So here are some lessons for us. Number one, you are flawed, okay? You might want to write that down. You might commit it to memory right now. Pretty easy to do. It's short and pithy, right? You need to understand that. That like great men and women of the Bible, you, we are flawed, and the Bible is not so kind as I, because the Bible states it much stronger. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. For effect. You are dead in your trespasses and sins. So we have two extremes to avoid. The first extreme is I could never be like them, the great men and women of the Bible, so I won't even try. The second is, well, they're flawed and so am I, so what? God loves me just the way I am. I've never liked that phrase, you know why? Because it's not true. God doesn't love you just the way you are. You know what? He loves you in spite of the way you are. He wants to change the way you are. Yes, he loves you unconditionally, but we can't use other sin as an excuse for ours. We can't use other successes as an excuse to say, I could never live up to that standard. We all have our individual walk with God. So the lesson is for, for us is this, just like them, you know, they were not perfect, but they demonstrated a sometimes imperfect faith in a faithful and a perfect God, right? That's the life of faith. We're not perfect. Our faith is incomplete like Abraham sometimes, but we place our imperfect faith in a faithful God. Now, the third thing that I want you to walk out with this morning is that God is gracious. God is gracious. Chapter 15 says this, after these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir, one of his servants who was born in his house, I'll just turn everything over to him. Maybe he will be the fulfillment of the promise. And then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir, even though you're almost 100 years old. Verse 6. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. This, you might want to mark this in your Bible, this is the first place in the Bible that the word believe ever occurs. Or faith. Faith comes after that. He was justified before God by his faith. He believed in God. And he said to him in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. He makes this unilateral covenant with Abraham. And it consists of these things. There was a promise of a great nation. He said in Genesis 12 too, And I will make you a great nation. 13, 16, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. In other words, too many to count. Second of all, there was a promise of a great land. In Genesis 15, 18, it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Euphrates. That's the promised land. All the way from Egypt to the Euphrates River over to the Persian Gulf. This has not yet been fulfilled, and God is a God of his word, and he will fulfill this. Part of the covenant is a promise of a great blessing. He said in 12.2, I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And part of the covenant also is a promise of a great savior. 
12.3, he says, And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. We know this, what this means from Galatians 3.8 that says, The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. When he said all the nations will be blessed in you, what he was saying is, you, from you, will come the Messiah, the seed, the promised one, the deliverer. Many, he didn't know when it was going to happen. He wasn't, didn't even have a child yet. But this was the promise of grace. And this is the promise of justification by faith. 500th anniversary of the Reformation is coming up where we who are all Protestants, we reclaimed this idea that we are justified by faith alone. That means that when we place our faith in Christ, we are declared to be righteous. It's the act of God. It's the work of God where he declares us to be righteous based upon our faith in Christ. And that when you believe that, that's when salvation occurs. I remember when we were going to the book of Romans and I was... Um, Doing some study, I read a story about a, a, a pastor who was going through Romans and he was preaching on justification by faith. And there was a young man visiting in the, in, the, in the service. And afterwards, someone came up to him and was greeting him and asked him, so how long have you been a Christian? And he said, about since 10 minutes into the service. When it was explained to him that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ and when you place your faith in Christ crucified and risen, you are declared to be righteous. And he gives us the righteousness of Christ. He takes our sin and he gives us the righteousness of Christ. That promise to Abraham so many years ago was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we have been blessed by that promise. But then I, I, you have to ask the question, why did God, if we're talking about grace, why did God choose Abraham? <laughs> he was an idolater. I, I don't know. Why did he choose me? Didn't he know how Abraham was going to respond? Of course he did. Didn't, didn't he know that Abraham would be inconsistent in his faith? Didn't he know that he would frequently stumble? Didn't he know that he would sin outright? Yes. Didn't God know what kind of man he was dealing with? Yes. Didn't God know how Abraham was going to respond when he was placed in extremis? Yes. But he wanted to change that, just like us, right? Right? He wanted Abraham to grow in faith and see God's faithfulness and grow in dependence and reliance upon him just like us. God keeps his word in spite of our flaws. And justification by faith is key to understanding the rest of the story. That's why the story of Abraham is so very, very important. Okay, some final lessons here. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. Some people say, well, the Old Testament people were saved by works. In the New Testament, they were saved by grace and faith. No, 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 no. Salvation has always been by God's grace through dependence, reliance, by faith in him, always. Abraham believed God before the law. There was no law. There was no nation yet. But Abraham believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. Throughout the scriptures, always been true. A lesson for us. I know we are all about grace as New Testament Christians and evangelicals, but we have a harder time with the flaws of others, don't we? In other words... When it comes to us, it's easy for us to say, oh, thank you, Father, for being so gracious to me. Thank you for saving me and loving me just the way I am. We appeal to God's grace, and then we impose God's standard upon others. These things not ought to be, beloved. We are to grow in grace and treat people with grace. Which brings us to our next lesson. Those who get grace 
give grace. Abraham became a man of grace. Abraham was gracious with Lot when they go into the land and they were getting, you know, their flocks were getting too numerous and uh, we need to separate. And he said to, Ab- to Lot, you take first choice of the land. I'll let you choose. I mean, he, he could have said, you know what? This kid has been a thorn on my side. He needs to learn some, some lessons here and I'm going to send him off to the, the land that is not so great. Turned out to be a bad choice for Lot. But Abraham was gracious. He did not keep anything for himself. He was not selfish. He was not greedy. He was humble. He was also gracious with Lot. When, when Lot was, uh, was captured by Keterleomer, the, the, the king who came and, and, and captured him and kidnapped his family, and Abraham got an army together and went and rescued him, that was mercy. Abraham was also Uh, gracious and merciful when the angel came and said they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and he didn't say yeah get those people he said Lord you know even if there are 10 righteous will you show some mercy and compassion you see over the years Abraham had learned grace and mercy and he had learned godliness by trusting in God and, and by observing how God treated him how about you Have you learned grace? Are you growing in grace? Tara and I were talking last week about this subject of grace and realizing we were in our 20s and 30s. You know, we were a bit judgmental about how people live their lives, how they raise their kids, what they did with their money. We've been knocked down a few times. We've had to learn grace so that we can give grace. We have a long way to go, but we have to realize that grace is begotten in trials and sometimes failure. But God is faithful. So, these three things. Like us, the great men and women of the Bible were incredibly incredibly flawed. Two, thank God, he is gracious. And three, God has called us all to live in extremis, to test our faith, to grow us in godliness. Father, we are grateful for this test, these tests that you bring our way. We are thankful for our salvation, for calling us very clearly to repentance from sin, and faith and life in Jesus Christ. I pray for everyone in this room, those who are struggling with what you want them to do, those who are struggling with trials and tests, may they see themselves as they are, may they see you as you are. And would you grow their faith to such an extent that you would be honored, that the name of the Lord would be proclaimed from the midst of trials. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.